what's up everyone, Game Dad here, coming at you guys with a brand new compilation video, this time taking a look at every video I did for my NES collection. Now at the time, I did have a couple hundred games in my NES collection, and that has definitely grown where I have about three quarters of a complete NES library now. Now they are not complete in box or anything like that, pretty much every single one of them is loose save for a few exceptions, but I am definitely getting to the point now where all that's left are some of the much more rare or expensive titles, so it is going to take a lot longer to complete the collection now. If you are new to the channel, please be sure to hit those like and subscribe buttons, as well as that little notification bell so you can alert every time I get a new video coming out. Now let's go ahead and dive in and check out all the videos that were in my NES collection series. All right, so up first we have 10 Yard Fight, released by IREM in 1985, and this is your typical NES style sports game. So you got your top-down football going on, and the game is okay, but honestly I think there are some better football games on the NES. Up next is 720, released by Tengen in 1989, and personally I'm more of a fan of the Skate or Die series, but 720 is just a classic. It is a little difficult to navigate on an NES, so it's a lot easier on the arcade with that ball controller. Here we have Adventure Island, released by Hudson Soft in 1988, and this is a fun side-scrolling platformer kind of runner style game. So you go through, you're collecting different upgrades and different items and stuff, dodging enemies, and just having a good time. Here is Adventure Island 3, released by Now Production in 1991, and this takes from the previous two games and just kind of builds on it even more. As you can see, there is more of an actual overworld and more of a clearly like laid out game design, and it really shows in the overall gameplay. Now here is The Adventures of Bayou Billy, released by Konami in 1989, and this is a kind of beat-em-up style game. You go through, you're playing as Bayou Billy, and you're just having some classic beat-em-up action. Now here we have A Boy and His Blob, Trouble on Bloblonia, released by Imagineering in 1990, and this is kind of a find-the-item, side-scrolling, kind of action-y sort of game. I mean, it's pretty fun, but not the greatest. Next up is Abadox, released by Natsume in 1990, and this is a shoot 'em up style game set in a bunch of different alien worlds and stuff, and this is actually the very first shoot 'em up game that I ever played as a kid, so I've got a lot of fun nostalgic memories for this game. Next up is Air Fortress, released by HAL Laboratory in 1989, and this is another shoot 'em up style game. You're just going through, as you can see, you're kind of at like a space station looking thing right here, and you just go through, collect your power-ups, and keep playing through that game. Up next, we got Al Unser Jr.'s Turbo Racing, released by Data East in 1990, and as you can see, you got a couple of different modes that you can choose from. You got some different options that you can set up, and then you go out and you do some IndyCar Racing Grand Prix style. A lot of fun. Up next, we have Anticipation, released by Rare in 1988. And this one's kind of fun because it's kind of like a version of Pictionary, but on the NES. As you can see right here, I am in the alphabet mode. So you go through and you guess the letter that is being drawn out on the screen. Here we have Arkanoid, released by Taito in 1987. And this is one of those fun NES games that came with a special controller. It gave you that little knob controller, just like on an actual arcade machine. So it's fun to go through and play kind of like a breakout style game on the NES. Now, here we have Back to the Future, released by Beam Software in 1989. And try as I might, I just could not get my Retron 5 to actually be able to help me capture any footage for this game. But, I mean, it's probably for the best, considering it is an LJN game. Up next is Bad Dudes, released by Data East in 1989. And in this game, classic beat-em-up, side-scrolling action. You're going through and trying to show that you are the baddest dude around. You're just beating up enemies and getting the job done. Up next is Bad Street Brawler, released by Beam Software in 1989. And this is another beat-em-up brawler kind of game. As you can see, the graphics are a little more corny in this. And you get some different moves, but overall, I think Bad Dudes is a lot better. Up next is a classic, Balloon Fight, released by Nintendo in 1986. And in this game, you're flying around, you got some balloons attached to you, and you're trying to take out the other little, like, bird mask-wearing enemies and stuff like that. You knock them down, then you knock them out. 
Next up is Bandai Golf Challenge Pebble Beach, released by Toes, T-O-S-E, in 1989. And this game is a typical kind of golf game. I didn't really get it very much. I'm not very good at golf personally, but, I mean, it looks okay graphically, I guess. Up next, we got Barbie, released by Imagineering in 1991, and this game sucks. Like, the platforming is terrible. As you can see, everything moves kind of like weird and slow it's buggy i mean yeah whatever it's just a barbie game now here is a game that does not suck and that is bases loaded released by tose in 1988 and this game is awesome because of the level of detail you can get into for a baseball game and as you can see the graphics as far as the nes goes look really amazing and the overall gameplay is a lot of fun up next, we have Bases Loaded 2, second season, also released by TOSE in 1990. And this game, it got a graphics jump, it got a little bit more in regards to stats, things like that. But overall, just as fun of a game. And here is Batman, released by Sunsoft in 1990. And this one is an action platformer beat-em-up kind of game. And graphically, I mean, it's pretty darn good for NES days. Gameplay-wise, it's okay. It does have some glitchy moments. But overall, I think it's a pretty fun game, even though he is purple. And here is Batman Return of the Joker, released by Sunsoft in 1991. And this game graphically is way better. And personally, I think the gameplay made a drastic improvement as well. The overall style of gameplay is kind of the same, but it's just a much better game. And up next, we have Battle Chess, released by Beam Software in 1990. And fun fact about this game, the very first time I ever played a digital chess game, it was Battle Chess, and it was actually for, I believe, Windows 3.1. So that takes you back to quite a long time ago. And here we have Battletoads, released by Rare in 1991. And anyone that knows anything about Battletoads knows that this game is just insanely difficult. But it is also a lot of fun. Graphically, it's awesome. It's another classic Rare game. And yeah, I mean, love having it in the collection. Up next, we have Battletoads and Double Dragon, released by Rare in 1993. And this is a fun crossover of the two games. As you can see, graphically, it's kind of the same thing. They added some new mechanics, stuff like that. But overall, still just another fun game. And here we have our first unlicensed game, which is Bible Adventures, released by Wisdom Tree in 1990. And, you know, say what you will about the whole unlicensed game thing on the NES, but even though these games are pretty religion heavy, they're actually a lot of fun. I mean, they're quick gameplay, they're not some massive crazy story good, but it's fun. Up next, we got Bigfoot by Beam Software in 1990, and this lets you play classic monster truck action, going through some different tracks, stuff like that. I mean, graphically, it's okay. Gameplay, it's a little weird to get used to with their 3D effect, but it's a fun game. Up next is Blaster Master, released by Sunsoft in 1988, and this is an awesome game with a great story, great gameplay mechanics. It can get a little buggy when you get a bunch of the different sprites on screen and stuff, but overall, this game is actually a ton of fun. Another classic, we got Bomberman, released by Hudson Soft in 1989, and this takes every mechanic that you know and love and strips it down bare bones because this was the first iteration of it. It gives you the classic gameplay mechanics and you have some awesome Bomberman fun. Another super fun game on the NES, and that is Breakthrough, released by Data East in 1987. And this one has a nice little overworld to show what's going on. And then you go through in some classic scroll and action. And it's kind of like a shooter, but in a car. So it's fun. Here is Bubble Bobble, released by Taito in 1988. And I am personally more of a fan of the Puzzle Bobble games. But this one overall is still fun. It's more of the original style game where you're going through and defeating enemies, getting through the different levels and stuff like that. And here we have Bucky O'Hare, released by Konami in 1992, and this is one of the more rare games that's actually in my NES collection, and it's one that's actually really fun to play too. Not many people remember the old cartoon, but I remember watching it as a kid, and the game is just as fun. And here we have the Bugs Bunny Birthday Blowout, released by Chemco in 1990. And this one, it's just like a regular platforming game. You get collectibles like carrots and stuff like that. And that's really all it is. It's kind of like a Looney Tunes game overall. 
Here is one of my personal favorites on the NES, and that is Burger Time, released by Data East in 1987. I don't know what it is about this game, but as a kid, even as an adult now, I mean, it's just so much fun to go through and play Burger Time, no matter what console it's on. I always have a blast. And here we have Captain Skyhawk, released by Rare in 1990. And this one, I really like the 3D effect that it gives the game. I mean, obviously, it's not actually in 3D, but as you can see, you know, they really play with the different dimensions of the level design, and it really works well. Here we have Castle Quest, released by ASCII in 1989. And, oh man, this game is crap. I mean, it looks like it would be a cute, fun little adventure kind of game, but it's just garbage. The controls suck, the graphics are meh at best, and I just don't like it. Up next, we have Castlevania II, Simon's Quest, released by Konami in 1988. And this one really expanded on the first game. And they gave you like this sort of village thing that you actually start in instead of just diving right into some levels. So you can go around, buy items, collect different things, and just have fun. And here we have Caveman Games, released by Painting by Numbers in 1990. And this game should have stayed in the prehistoric age that it came from. It's garbage. It tries to be fun for fighting, and it's just not. Championship Bowling was released by Athena in 1989, and this just takes classic bowling action, puts it on the NES, and lets you have fun, you know, throwing down, knocking down a few pins in the lane. Chippendale Rescue Rangers was released by Capcom in 1990, and this is probably in my top 10 of my personal favorite NES games. I just always had a blast playing through this game, getting all the collectibles, playing as all the different characters from a TV show that I really enjoyed as a kid. City Trouble was released by Mega Cat Studios in 2018 and is one of the games that I have in my current homebrew collection. So in this game, you run around tasing people, fighting bad guys, getting collectibles, and just having a good old time. Clue Clue Land was released by Nintendo in 1985, and in this game you actually go around spinning around all these little pegs and stuff to reveal different pictures made out of coins. Once you reveal the picture, then you get to move on to the next level. It's a little weird to get used to at first, but overall it's a pretty fun game. Conquest of the Crystal Palace was released by Quest in 1990, and this was actually one of the first Nintendo games I had in my collection. My brother is the one who had the Nintendo, and eventually we ended up with this game in our collection, and I just have fond nostalgic memories of playing this as a kid. Contra was released by Konami in 1988, and I gotta say, not only was this my first introduction to the Konami code, but this game is also probably one of my top NES games of all time. I can play through this game anytime and always have a blast. Darkwing Duck was released by Capcom in 1992, and this game follows the same formula that a lot of games from Capcom did at this time. So you have some classic platforming action, you go around, you have some different collectibles. One thing that I did like about this game in particular, though, was the ability to hang by a grappling hook to help you really progress through the levels. Dash Galaxy in the Alien Asylum. This was released by Beam Software in 1990, and it gives you various different puzzle aspects. You get to move different blocks around, find different things, but then it takes you from a top-down game into a side-scrolling game, so it's kind of fun to see a mix of both. Days of Thunder was released by Beam Software in 1990, and I gotta say, this game is just super boring. I mean, as you can see, they did like a cool 3D kind of effect, which was neat on the NES, but overall, I mean, there's not really much to this game. Defender 2 was released by Vid Kids in 1988, and this just takes classic Defender gameplay and it gives you kind of a more modern twist on it for this era. So you have same basic gameplay, you can go back and forth, you're shooting different enemies, stuff like that, but you get some updated graphics with it. Dig Dug 2 was released by Namco in 1989, and this is another one of those games that on the NES just takes advantage of an awesome IP and makes it just new and fresh. In this game, you actually go through and you can slice off different parts of the island, as you see here. 
Disney's Adventures in the Magic Kingdom was released by Capcom in 1990. And this kind of is a game where you, I guess, virtually go through the Disneyland theme park. And you get to do some mini games and stuff like that. Overall, I didn't really find the game very fun, though. Donkey Kong Classics, released by Nintendo in 1988. In this NES game, it takes you through a bunch of the classic arcade modes that were available in Nintendo arcade cabinets. As you can see from the title screen, it had Donkey Kong and Donkey Kong Jr. And right here you can see some gameplay of the original Donkey Kong arcade game. The original Donkey Kong arcade classic series, released by Nintendo in 1986. And this, just like the previous game, takes you through the various modes of the original Donkey Kong arcade game. And honestly, like, I always love playing this game. So it's fun to have multiple variations in the collection. Here we have Donkey Kong 3, released by Nintendo in 1986. And this is the only one I've never actually played on an arcade machine. So this was a totally different concept for a Donkey Kong game. As you can see, it's the only appearance you have of this character that's going around doing bug spraying instead of classic Donkey Kong. And here we have Donkey Kong Jr. released by Nintendo in 1986. And what I like about having this one in my collection is that I actually have the original arcade machine as well of Donkey Kong Jr. And that was actually the first one that I did a full repair on. So kind of fun being able to have an NES version of an arcade machine. Up next, we have Double Dragon, released by Trade West in 1988. And this one is probably my least favorite in this trilogy of Double Dragon games on the NES. The controls were just really clunky. I didn't really like the character models, and it just wasn't that fun to me overall. Up next, we have Double Dragon 2 The Revenge, released by Acclaim in 1990. And I gotta say, out of the trilogy, this one is probably my favorite and the one that got the most gameplay time as a kid. My buddy Chris and I, we used to play this game constantly. I thought it was a little weird how you had to face the opposite direction to do kicks, but overall, super fun game. Now for the last one in the trilogy, we have Double Dragon 3 The Sacred Stones, released by Acclaim in 1991. Now, as a kid, this one did not get a lot of gameplay from me, but when I was going through and capturing footage, I found that this game was actually pretty fun. I liked the updated graphics, the controls were a little better, and you even got some new moves. Up next is Double Dribble, released by Konami in 1987, and this one is just a classic, fun basketball game on the NES. I mean, the graphics aren't great, and as you can see, it gets a little overloaded on the screen, but overall, I mean, this is a pretty fun game. I like it. Up next, we got another homebrew game. Unfortunately, I am not sure who actually made this or when it came out, but this is one of those homebrew games that I actually got from John Riggs. So this one's fun. As you can see, it's a Dr. Mario homebrew and goes through, adds a few different Zelda elements to it. Here we have an absolute classic that is Duck Hunt, released by Nintendo in 1985. And this is, of course, a zapper game. Now, unfortunately, in capturing footage, I had no way to be able to connect a zapper up to actually show some of the ducks getting taken out. But here's some basic gameplay for you. Now, here's an absolutely fun game. This is DuckTales, released by Capcom in 1989. And this game, the graphics are awesome. The level design is great. I love the pogo stick effect whenever you're bouncing on Scrooge McDuck's cane. This game overall is just an amazing game. Up next, we got another homebrew by Mega Cat Studios released in 2018. And this is Dushlin or Dushlin. And it's essentially a Tetris game with a few new moves and effects to it, basically. But at its core, it's totally a Tetris game. Here we have a more recent pickup in my collection. That is Dino Wars Destruction of Spondylus, released by Bandai in 1990. And this game is kind of fun. It, you go around kind of platformer, Mega Man-esque, and defeating enemies, things like that. And overall, I kind of like it. And here we have yet another homebrew. That is Earthbound Beginnings, released by the Video Games Database in 2018. And this is one I ordered off of them after catching a John Riggs video. And I gotta say, this game is awesome. It's totally Earthbound on the NES. Comes with an awesome color cart, and it's just a fun game. 
Up next, we have Explode and Short Order, released by TOSE in 1989. And this is a combo kind of game where it's got a couple different games going on. You can see like the characters from the game kind of fighting each other to get their title on the screen. But just some fun, classic Nintendo action, and you get a combo. Up next, we have Excite Bike, released by Nintendo in 1985. And this game really put like dirt bike games on the map. I mean, of course it was from the 8-bit era and of course it was just a 2D side scroller, but you know what? This game was awesome and you could even design your own tracks. It was so cool. And here we have our first unlicensed game. That is The Fantastic Adventures of Dizzy, released by Comerica in 1993. And this game is your typical action platformer collectathon, but overall not very fun and yeah, that's pretty much it. Here we have a great RPG on the NES, and that is Foxanadu, released by Hudson Soft in 1989. And this one, you go through, it has a very Final Fantasy kind of vibe to it. And you collect different items. As you can see, you're starting a nice little text journey right here. And it's just fun overall. Up next is Fester's Quest, released by Sunsoft in 1989, and this is actually my very first memory of a video game ever. I remember playing this with my brother, watching him play. He got an NES when he was a teenager, and this was one of the games that he got with it, and I remember just hours and hours of having fun with this. And here we have Fisher Price I Can Remember by Davidson Associates, released in 1990. And this one is a kind of, you know, turn the card over matching game. And I mean, it operates very slowly. I don't see how a kid could have ever had the patience for this, but, you know, basic matching stuff. Up next is Freedom Force, released by Sunsoft in 1988. And, I mean, you can get kind of an idea of what might be happening in the game, like, you know, some sort of typical disaster. they got to call in, you know, the heroes of the game. But I was having a lot of trouble getting it to get past this title screen, so I don't know a lot about it. Up next, we have Gauntlet 2, released by Tengen in 1990. And this is classic RPG almost at its finest. I wouldn't say it's the finest RPG out there, but it is still a really fun game. You go around, you collect different things, you fight off baddies, and you just have a good old-fashioned adventure. Now here we have Genghis Khan, released by Koei in 1990. And I gotta say, I did not dive that deep into this game because it is just not my cup of tea. I am not a huge fan of these old school Dynasty Warrior Romance of the Three Kingdoms kind of games. So here's some gameplay, but that's about it. Now here we have Ghosts and Goblins, released by Micronics in 1986. Now, this one ended up also being called Ghouls and Ghosts, or Super Ghouls and Ghosts on the Super Nintendo, and this game is awesome. It's insanely difficult, but it is so much fun, and this is a classic side-scrolling game. And the last game for this video is Ghostbusters 2, released by Imagineering in 1990, and... All I can really say about this one is at least it's not as bad as the first one. That one was crap. This one, they at least give you more of a side-scrolling kind of game, a platformer, but overall still not great. Gogo 13 Top Secret Episode was released by Vic Tokai in 1988 and takes you on a sort of super secret spy mission in a kind of a beat-em-up slash platformer style game. I mean, it's okay. It's not the greatest, though. The Goonies 2 was released by Konami in 1987, and this takes a kind of movie-style approach, but as you can see, the graphics aren't that great, even by NES standards, and there's just a lot of stuff going on in the game that doesn't really feel like it fits the franchise at all. Gotcha! The Sport was released by Atlas in 1987 and brings the awesome game of paintball to the NES. So this is another addition to the NES collection that actually allows for light gun use. So it's always fun to be able to find new light gun games. Gradius was released by Konami in 1986 and is an excellent example of a side-scrolling shooter on the NES. It takes you through all the classic stuff that you would expect, all kinds of different objects, power-ups, and everything that you would want to see in a shmup. Gumshoe was released by Nintendo in 1986, and this is another game that I have in the collection that is an awesome Nintendo light gun game. So in this one, you can go around shooting different things to gather up points, and you just play through all the awesome levels that it has. 
Gunsmoke was released by Capcom in 1988, and in this awesome NES classic game, you actually go through a old western style top-down shooter kind of game. So it's kind of fun that it shows a character instead of like a vehicle or a ship, and you just have fun blasting away at enemies. Gyromite was released by Nintendo in 1985, and this is actually one of two games that utilize Rob, or the Robot Operating Buddy. And in this game, it uses a series of flashes of lights. That way, it can control Rob to raise and lower different platforms so you can get through the levels. Up next, we have Heavy Barrel, released by Data East in 1990. And in this game, it feels to me like it's kind of like a top-down Contra game on the NES, but you go through in a vertical scrolling kind of way. So also kind of like Jackal or other games of that type. Up next, we have Heavy Shredden, released by Imagineering in 1990. And in this game, you just get to snowboard and bomb down that mountain. Now, I didn't really think that the controls were very good in this game. It was a little weird, kind of kept dragging to one side or the other. But overall, I mean, it was okay. High Speed was released by Rare in 1991, and in this game you get to go through and play some classic pinball action. Now overall, I don't think the graphics are very good even by NES standards in this game, and the way they do the split screen is a little weird, but I mean, it is pinball. Holy Diver was released by Irem in 2018, and this one is actually a worldwide re-release of the original Holy Diver that used to only be a Famicom game. Now, in this game, you take over as Dio, and you just play through a Castlevania-style game. It's actually really fun. The Hunt for Red October was released by Beam Software in 1991, and in this game, you are basically playing through the plot of the movie, The Hunt for Red October. Up next, we have Ikari Warriors, released by Micronix in 1987, and in this game, it is another classic top-down kind of shooter game, vertical scrolling, a lot like Jackal and many of the other games that were out at this time. Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom was released by Tengen in 1988, and this one was actually quite a bit more fun than some of the other Indiana Jones games, in my opinion. You actually got some whip action that you got to do, and the gameplay just felt a little more solid overall. Infiltrator was released by Mindscape in 1990, and this game kind of feels like a battle zone or like the old vector tank games, but the premise is you're actually driving a helicopter, even though the overall gameplay mechanics feel very similar to tank games. Up next, we have Isolated Warrior, released by KID, or KID, in 1991. And the best way that I can really describe this game is kind of like a vertical shmup meets a beat-em-up. And, I mean, it is pretty fun, but overall, I didn't really care for it. And up next, we have Jack Nicklaus's Greatest 18 Holes of Major Championship Golf, released by Sculptured Software in 1990. That is a very long-winded title for a game that is not very good, in my opinion. I mean, it's just a golf game on the NES, and I didn't find it very appealing. Up next, we have Jackal, released by Konami in 1988. And I have already referenced this a couple of times in this video, but that is mainly because this is one of my favorite games of this type on the NES. It's just classic shooting action going around in that Jeep. And here we have Jeopardy! Junior Edition, released by Rare in 1989, and this is exactly what you would expect. It's a Jeopardy! game, but it has several easier questions for juniors to play, for a bunch of kids to be able to play. So, still fun, but kind of simplistic. And here we have John Elway's Quarterback, released by Leland Corporation in 1989. And as with most sports games, I'm just not really that big of a fan. I mean, at least I knew who John Elway was this time. But overall, I don't really get the appeal of games like this. Up next, we have Jordan vs. Bird, one-on-one, -on -one, released by Rare in 1989. And in this game, you get some classic one-on-one -on -one half court action, and you're playing as two of basketball's greats. You got Larry Bird and Michael Jordan. So you just get to have some classic fun shooting some hoops. 
And here we have another Wisdom Tree game. That is Joshua and the Battle of Jericho, released by Wisdom Tree in 1992. And this one is just kind of like a, a Lolo's adventure kind of game. So you go through, you have some puzzle stuff you got to do, collect some items, and then reach the exit. And that's pretty much it. And up next, we have another classic from the Age of Atari, and that is Joust, released by HAL Laboratory in 1988. This takes the same classic gameplay that was originally on the Atari 2600 and gives it that sweet, sweet 8-bit upgrade. As you can see, the colors are really nice. And here we have Karate Champ, released by Data East in 1986. And unlike a few of the other games that are of this nature on the NES, this one actually controls pretty well. I mean, it's very simplistic, but overall, I mean, when you try to hit someone, it actually hits them. And here we have The Karate Kid, released by Atlas in 1987, but unfortunately this is also an LJN game. And, oh man, does this game suck. The knockback from enemies alone is just enough to make you just want to rip your hair out. Up next we got another homebrew, and that is Kelbert, released by John Riggs. Now I'm not sure when he originally made this game, but I think it's been in the past couple of years or so. But this game is essentially Qbert, but with all the characters and people from Metal Jesus Rocks. And up next is one of my personal favorites from the NES days. That is Kid Icarus, released by Nintendo in 1987. And in this game, you go through vertical platforming as opposed to the traditional side-scrolling platforming. So it's a fun take on a classic style of gaming. And here we have Kid Nicky Radical Ninja, released by Toast in 1987. And this game is very simplistic looking i mean i really think they could have done a better job with the sprites and stuff but you just go through you're kind of beating people up doing some platforming and just having a little bit of fun here is another unlicensed nes game that is king of kings the early years released by wisdom tree in 1991 and this one takes you through three different kind of story type things you got some difficulty settings etc and you just go through and do some platforming with their typical fast gameplay up next, we've got Kings of the Beach, released by Konami in 1990, and this one has a very skater die kind of feel to it with this whole menu overworld, but then overall, I mean, it's just a classic beach volleyball game. And here we have the game that gave Kirby an upgrade. That is Kirby's Adventure, released by HAL Laboratory in 1993. And in this game, you get all the same classic action as Kirby's Dream Land, but in full color. And now you have the option to actually maintain abilities that you steal from different enemies. Here we have Knight Rider, released by Pack-In Video in 1989. And this game, in my opinion, is totally boring. You go around, you can shoot stuff, and you can drive. That's basically it. I didn't get very far into the game. And another martial arts game. That is Kung Fu, released by Nintendo in 1985. And in this game, it's kind of just a side-scrolling beat-em-up. But it's kind of weird because instead of scrolling left to right, you actually scroll right to left. So I thought that was a different take on this kind of genre. Up next is Laser Invasion, released by Konami in 1991, and in this game you are piloting kind of like a like fighter jet sort of thing, and you are just shooting down all the enemies that you can find. Feels kind of like a futuristic Top Gun. And a Disney classic on NES indeed, that is The Little Mermaid, released by Capcom in 1991. And in this game, it has a very Echo the Dolphin feel, but obviously not as good, considering it came out long before Echo the Dolphin. Now here is a game that I played a lot as a kid, that is Little Nemo the Dream Master, released by Capcom in 1990. And this was just a fun action platforming kind of game. You could go up, down, side to side, and you could absorb all kinds of different enemies and get suits made out of them. And the last game for this video is Log Jammers, released by Mega Cat Studios in, I believe, 2018. And in this game, it's kind of like Pong, but they can catch and throw it back at you, and you're actually using axes while walking on logs. Adventures of Lolo was released by HAL Laboratory in 1989 and is a fun puzzle adventure kind of game where you move around different blocks and objects, you get rid of enemies, and it allows you to be able to collect a key and move on to the next level.
Adventures of Lolo 2 by HAL Laboratory was released in 1990 and is a continuation of the Lolo franchise. As you can see, my cart right here has some pretty rough label damage and I wasn't able to capture any footage, but it's another fun Lolo game. And moving right along, we have Adventures of Lolo 3, released by HAL Laboratory in 1991. Again, this continues the story, but this time it gives you a bit of a overworld map, which the previous games didn't actually have. It has the same puzzle mechanics, though, so it's still super fun. Loops was released by Mindscape in 1990 and is another kind of puzzle game, but this time it has you taking different objects and stuff to create different loops on the screen, and every time you create a new loop, you get more points and that loop goes away and so on and so forth. Maniac Mansion was released by Lucasfilm Games in 1990, and in this game you go on a point-and-click adventure and you are trying to solve different mysteries within the mansion. Marvel Madness was released by Rare in 1989, and this is actually one of my first memories of NES games. In this, you actually play as a little marble, and the point is to get from point A to point B without either cracking the marble or falling off the ledge. Mario Bros. was released by Nintendo in 1986, and this takes the actual Mario Bros. arcade game and puts it on the NES. So you go through and you're trying to take out the different turtles and different enemies while avoiding fireballs and collecting coins. Mega Man was released by Capcom in 1987 and is the first of a long line of various Mega Man games. The premise has always been the same. You fight some bosses, you earn some powers, and those help you fight even more bosses. Mega Man 2 was released by Capcom in 1989 and, in my opinion, is a drastic improvement over the original game. The graphics are better, the gameplay is more fine-tuned, and even the menu selection even looks just so much better. Mega Man 3 was released by Capcom in 1990 and is actually my first memory of a Mega Man game. My friends and I would play this game for hours trying to get to Dr. Wily and just beat the game. There is so much to be had in this game, I really think that this is when the series really hit its stride. Mega Man 4 was released by Capcom in 1992, and this is just another classic Mega Man game on the NES. I mean, you go through, you fight your different bosses, then eventually you are able to unlock and go after Dr. Wily. And here we have Mega Man 5, released by Capcom in 1992, and Capcom just kept running with, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. They added some new abilities, things like that, as the games got more advanced, but overall it was the exact same gameplay premise. And here we have Mega Man 6, the last one to be released on the NES, and this was released by Capcom in 1994, and again they were following that same good old fashioned formula that they had been for the previous five games. Now here we have the original Metal Gear, released by Konami in 1988. And in this game, you experience kind of a isometric slash top-down kind of view. You go through, you get constant, what seems like never-ending messages on the radio, and then you fight some baddies. Here is Metroid, released by Nintendo in 1987, and this is the game that started it all. That creepy, creepy intro music, and all those awesome powers that Samus Aran has. Up next is Mickey Mouse Capade, released by Hudson Soft in 1988, and in this game you get to play as Minnie and Mickey. You go through kind of a tag team platforming action kind of game. So, I mean, it's pretty fun. It has its quirks, but it's alright. And here is the follow-up to the classic Centipede. We have Millipede, released by HAL Laboratory in 1988. And the gameplay in this is essentially the same. To me, the game feels a little bit faster and feels like they just added a few extra things overall. I mean, I prefer Centipede. And here is Mission Impossible, released by Konami in 1990. And in this game, you go through kind of top-down, but also side-scroller. And you are facing off with different enemies. You're going on the different missions, should you choose to accept. And you just go from there. Up next is NES Open Tournament Golf, released by Nintendo in 1991, and it is just golf with Mario. I mean, the game overall I don't think is very fun. There are better golf games on the NES, but I mean, you know, Nintendo had to throw their hat into the ring as well. And here we have Ninja Gaiden, released by Tecmo in 1989, and this has got to be one of the most difficult games on the NES. I mean, it's just insanely hard to play this game, but 
it's also extremely fun to play this game. I really enjoy the Ninja Gaiden series. Up next, we have Ninja Gaiden 2, The Dark Sword of Chaos, released by Tecmo in 1990. And this is a continuation of the Ninja Gaiden trilogy on the NES. The gameplay overall is the same, and I would say that this one isn't as difficult as the first one, but still fun. And lastly, we have Ninja Gaiden 3, The Ancient Ship of Doom, released by Tecmo in 1991. And again, this is a continuation of that trilogy on the NES. They keep with the same classic gameplay, and this one adds a few new elements and enemies, but that's about it. Up next, we got Pac-Man, released by Namco in 1993. And this is a way better home port than the one that was on the Atari. Man, was that one crap, and is this one not? This one is darn near arcade perfect and is a blast to play. And here we have Paperboy 2, released by Tengen in 1992, four years after the original one. So as you can see, there's a bit of a graphics upgrade. I don't really like how everything is kind of mirrored compared to the original Paperboy, and it seems a lot more zoomed in. But overall, I mean, it's still a fun Paperboy game. And up next we have Pinball, released by Nintendo in 1985, and this is actually one of the launch titles for the NES. It's one of the original black box games. Now, it is very simplistic, but it does exactly what you would expect it to do. It is a pinball game. And now for a better pinball game. This is Pinbot, released by Rare in 1990. And this game comes with better graphics, better gameplay, and all around just a better experience playing pinball on the NES. And up next is an old classic, that is Pipe Dream, released by Distinctive Software in 1990. And the whole object behind this game is you got some ooze that's coming and you gotta lay down some pipe, that way it has somewhere to go. And here is another one of my homebrews. This is Pokemon Yellow, otherwise known as the Special Pikachu Edition, released by the Video Games Database in, I believe, 2018. Now, my Retron 5 couldn't capture any footage of this, but it is totally Pokemon Yellow on the NES. It's awesome. And here is another classic on the NES, and that is Popeye, released by Nintendo in 1986. Now, this one is normally seen as an arcade game, and personally, I think it's a lot better as an arcade game. The NES version was pretty much mediocre at best. Here we have Pro Wrestling, released by Nintendo in 1987, and this is where you get to choose your favorite wrestler, go out, and just duke it out in the ring. Pretty fun, but I'm not a huge wrestling game fan overall. Here we have Punch-Out, released by Nintendo in 1990. And this one was actually the later release. So this one is the same game as the next one you'll see in the list, except they changed a few of the characters around because of licensing issues. And here's the original one. We got Mike Tyson's Punch-Out, released by Nintendo in 1987. Again, same kind of game, but Mike Tyson is actually the boss at the end of the game. So you get to go through, play all through the different characters, and then at the end you get to face the king of the ring himself, Mike Tyson. Here's a super fun game on the NES, and that is Qbert, released by Konami in 1989. You go around as this weird little character named Qbert, and you are just trying to light up all the different tiles. It's got a very weird control scheme that takes a little bit to get used to, but once you get the hang of it, it's a really fun game. Here we have RC Pro-Am, released by Rare in 1988, and this is probably one of my favorite games on the NES. I remember countless hours playing through this game. It's just so much fun because you get to play as essentially micro machines that are radio controlled. And here we have RC Pro-Am 2, released by Rare in 1992, and in this one, you actually get a few more options. You get to race as some different vehicles, and you also get to upgrade your vehicle a lot more. So, this game was actually a pretty cool one to add to the collection. Up next, we have Rad Racer, released by Square in 1987, and in this game, you get to take on some classic racing action, and you just drive down that road, but be careful of those turns. And here we have Rad Racer 2, released by Square in 1990, and in this game you get a lot of the same classic action you did in the original Rad Racer, except you also get some better gameplay and actually what I think is dramatically improved graphics overall. And the last game for this video is Rambo, released by Pack-In Video in 1988, and in this one you get to go through as Rambo and have some classic action going on, taking out the baddies. 
Rampage was released by Data East in 1998 and takes that classic arcade action of Rampage and puts it on the NES. It's super fun. You get to enjoy all your classic characters and you just get to go destroying stuff. It's great. Robocop was released by Data East in 1989, and in this game you get your classic side-scroller beat-em-up style game, but you're playing as the Robocop. It was okay, it was a little buggy to me, kind of slow, but overall, I mean, it is a Robocop game. Up next, we got another homebrew, Rock, Paper, Scissors, released by WRY Games in 2015, and this just brings classic Rock, Paper, Scissors to the NES. It works a lot like a Tetris, Dr. Mario-style game, but with classic Rock, Paper, Scissors rules. Rocket Ranger was released by Cinemaware in 1990, and in this game, you look through the map, you find places that you want to go, and then you send your character there. And whenever you get there, you get to do just classic NES gaming. That's really it. Up next, we got Roger Clemens MVP Baseball, released by Sculptured Software in 1991. And this takes the typical NES baseball game and just gives you all that awesome detail where you can swap out your players, you can check your stats, various things, and then you just play the game. Up next, we have Russian Attack, released by Konami in 1987. And in this game, it's your typical early release NES side-scrolling action kind of game. So it has sort of a Contra feel, but is nowhere near as fun. The game is very primitive. And here we have Rygar, released by Tecmo in 1987. And in this action-adventure platformer kind of game, you get a lot of story. The graphics aren't super like crazy insane or anything like that for the NES, but overall, the game is actually a lot of fun to play. And here we have Shahrazad, released by Culture Brain in 1989. And this one is a top-down adventure game that kind of feels like it's a wannabe Zelda, but it's nowhere near as good. As you can see, there's only really a couple different colors for characters, and gameplay is kind of rough. Here we have Section Z, released by Capcom in 1987. And this is actually my very first experience with a side-scrolling shooter game. And this game is awesome. It really is a super fun shmup on the NES. It has everything you would expect. Here is Sesame Street 123, released by Rare in 1989. And this is obviously a more simplistic kids kind of game, but it has a bunch of little mini games built into it that teach you all about counting and things like that. So it's great for kids. Up next, we have Sesame Street ABC, released by Rare in 1989. And this particular copy of the game, I was having a lot of trouble getting it to reliably capture footage. So you'll actually see a little bit more of that in what I have in the next game. Now here is Sesame Street ABC and 123, released by Rare in 1991. And this one is actually a combo cart of the previous two games. So I happened to pick this up one day at a yard sale when I saw it, and it's, it's kind of fun. I mean, it's a kid's game, and it takes you through the same kind of little mini games. And next we have Shatterhand, released by Natsume in 1991. And this is a side-scrolling, beat-em-up style, kind of shooter-esque game. But it has these awesome power-ups that allow you to actually become like the Shatterhand warrior. And here we have Shinobi, released by Tengen in 1989, and unfortunately this was another one that the Retron 5 was just having a lot of issues trying to get playback on, so I unfortunately do not have any game cap of this. Up next is Silent Service, released by Rare in 1989, and in this game you kind of navigate the oceans as a submarine. I don't know, maybe there's more detail in the actual game manual for this, but I don't have it, so this game was kind of hard to follow. Up next is The Simpsons, Bart vs. the Space Mutants, released by Imagineering in 1991. And this game is just classic Simpsons on the NES. I remember playing this a ton as a kid and always having a blast just skating around, bopping aliens, and playing some Simpsons. Up next we have The Simpsons, Bart vs. the World, also released by Imagineering, and this time in 1991. And this one, it kind of gives you just a different story. And instead of aliens and stuff like that, it's more of you know, homegrown issues that are going on. Here we have Skate or Die, released by Konami in 1988. And although this game is fun once you get a hang of the controls, that right there is a pretty big deterrent for when you first start playing this game. The controls are super obnoxious, especially in that half pipe. 
Now here we have Skate or Die 2, The Search for Double Trouble, released by EA in 1990. And this one, as you can see, is more of a side-scrolling version of a Skate or Die game. Still pretty fun, but still has some really weird controls. Up next is Sky Shark, released by Software Creations in 1989. And yet again, my Retron 5 totally failed me on this. This video has a few of these games where the Retron was just not able to play these games effectively. And I don't really want to point a camera at a TV screen to show you footage. Up next is Slalom, released by Rare in 1987, and this is your typical slalom skiing game. It was actually pretty fun. It felt kind of like a car racing game, but they just made it a skier instead. So it was a very familiar mechanic, familiar obstacles and controls, and it was fun. Now here we have Snake's Revenge, released by Konami in 1990, and technically I guess this would be considered Metal Gear 2 because this was the second Metal Gear game on the NES. And this one, I would say, is actually more fun than the original, but graphically, there really wasn't much of an improvement. Up next is Snow Brothers, released by Capcom in 1991, and this is one of the more rare titles in my collection. And I'm happy to say that this is a game that's actually kind of fun for being one of the rare ones. Normally, they're kind of dumb games, but this one I have a lot of fun playing. And here we have Solomon's Key, released by Tecmo in 1987, and this is the last one in this video where I was having issues with game capture. For whatever reason, it would play on the NES, but it would not play on the Retron 5, so I unfortunately do not have any footage of it. Here we have Solstice, the quest for the Staff of Demnos, released by Software Creations in 1990. And this is a fun action-adventure RPG kind of style game, but instead of seeing the whole world at once, you see the world through all these small screens. You go through the door, you get a new screen. Now we have Spot the Video Game, released by Virgin Mastertronic in 1990. And this one has kind of like a Connect 4 kind of vibe to it. I definitely prefer the Spot games on the Sega Genesis versus the NES. Up next is Spy Hunter, released by Sunsoft in 1987, and this one is a top-down driving game, but you also get weapons, so it's kind of like a vertical shooter, but I don't know, it's kind of hard to explain, but it is pretty fun to just drive around and blow stuff up. Up next is Spy vs. Spy, released by Chemco in 1988, and this game, I couldn't really tell what I was supposed to do. Maybe there's more info in the game manual, but again, I do not have the manual for this game, so I just kind of walked around trying to figure out what I could do. Up next is Star Trek 25th Anniversary, released by Interplay Entertainment in 1992. And this one takes you through some classic Star Trek scenarios, but kind of feels like a more of like a Bridge Commander game. Kind of like that newer one that came out recently that you can do in VR. Up next is Star Voyager, released by ASCII or ASCII in 1987. And in this game, it kind of feels like a tank battalion sort of game, but it's set in space instead of being on land. I mean, it really operates just like a tank game, but you're shooting in space. Now here's another super fun one, and that is Star Wars, released by Beam Software in 1991. Now this kind of has like, you know, like moon gravity to it when you're running and jumping and stuff, but overall I always have a ton of fun whenever I play this game. Up next we have Star Tropics, released by Nintendo in 1990, and in this game you have a top-down overworld action-adventure kind of game, and then you go into different villages and different areas, and you complete different tasks while in there. And here we have Super C, released by Konami in 1990, and this one really tried to be like kind of an upgraded Contra game, but honestly, I personally believe that there is no better Contra game than the very first one that came out on the NES. Up next is Super Dodgeball, released by Sony ImageSoft in 1989, and in this game you get just a classic game of dodgeball going on, but as you can see, this game really stretched the NES to its limits. You can tell by all the flashing characters that are happening because it's just having trouble loading all the sprites on the screen. And here is Super Glove Ball, released by Rare in 1990, and this is actually the only game I have that I can use my Power Glove with. I haven't actually tried it out yet to see how it plays, but I've heard that it is not great. And no collection would be complete without Super Mario Bros, released by Nintendo in 1985. 
there isn't really much I can say about this game that hasn't been said to death because it's been covered by everybody and their monkey. But, hey, it's Mario. It's awesome. You gotta love it. Now, this is just one of the variations that I have of this game. That's the Mario Bros. and Duck Hunt combo released by Nintendo in 1988. And this just gives you the original Super Mario Bros. game and then plus Duck Hunt. I actually have both of these games as separate carts and then I have multi-carts. And the last game in this video is Super Mario Bros. 2, released by Nintendo in 1988. Now, this is not the Japanese one. This is the one where they took Doki Doki Panic from the Famicom and totally ripped it off and just put a Mario skin over it. Still a fun game, though. Super Mario Bros. 3 was released by Nintendo in 1990 and is a continuation of this classic franchise on the NES. This one was the first one to truly have an overworld and really introduce you to a bunch of new worlds that Mario had to offer. The Super Mario Bros. Duck Hunt World Class Track Meet Cart was released by Nintendo in 1990 and is a fun combination cart giving you three classic Nintendo games all in one. It gives you the classic Mario Bros. Duck Hunt, and then it adds world-class track meet to the mix. Super Off-Road was released by Rare in 1990, and gives you that classic arcade action feel on the NES. Sure, the graphics aren't as great as an arcade machine, but it still gets the job done, and it's a lot of fun to be able to play that top-down kind of style arcade game where you just race around the track and have a blast. Super Team Games was released by Human Entertainment in 1988, and it takes the typical style of different kind of like track meet games or multi kind of Olympic game carts, and it makes it a little more kid friendly, plus it lets you use the power pad. Superman was released for the NES by Chemco in 1988, and I gotta be honest, this is not a very good game. I mean, it's kind of weird graphically, it seems really simplistic even for the NES, and it just doesn't really make much sense. TNC Surf Designs Wood and Water Rage was released by Atlas in 1988, and this game kind of combines a lot of different things like, say, from Skater Die, 720, games like that, and puts it all in one, and I gotta be honest, it's actually pretty fun. Tecmo NBA Basketball was released by Sculptured Software in 1992 and is a lot like many other basketball games on the NES. It lets you choose your teams, it lets you go through not necessarily a full season of play, but it lets you go through, play different games, you can do CPU, and it's pretty fun. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles was released by Konami in 1989, and this game combines a lot of top-down and side-scrolling action. This is a classic game, but it also has a classically hard level with that underwater dynamite at the dam. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 2, the arcade game, was released by Konami in 1990 and brings the actual TMNT arcade game from Arcade Cabinets to the NES. And I gotta say, it's actually a pretty decent port. Obviously, the graphics aren't as good as an arcade machine, but all the gameplay is there and it's still a ton of fun. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 3, The Manhattan Project, was released by Konami in 1992, and this one kind of combines the feel of the first game with the arcade action of the second. This one, personally, is my favorite on the NES and is a ton of fun to play. Tennis was released by Nintendo in 1985 and is exactly what you would expect. It's tennis on the NES. Instead of having a classic Pong style where it's going left to right, as you can see, it's going from bottom to top, top to bottom. And the game overall is pretty basic in nature, but I mean, it's all right. Tetris was released by Nintendo in 1989 and is the same game that you know and love from every other console that it's always been on. And it's just, it's Tetris. I mean, what more is there to say? The blocks drop, you get your Tetris lines, and you keep going. Tetris 2 was released by Nintendo in 1993. So this one is actually a pretty late release on the NES. It takes classic Tetris, and it adds a few new options and different quirks to the game. And it gives it more, to me, of a Dr. Mario kind of feel. Tiny Toons Adventures was released by Konami in 1991. And in this game, you follow along with the different characters from Tiny Toons, and you just have a blast. It's a typical action platformer. It definitely has a Bugs Bunny 50th anniversary kind of feel to it graphically. 
Tiny Toons Adventures 2, Trouble in Wacky Land, was released by Konami in 1993. So this is another fairly late release in the NES life cycle, but this one it added more of an option to choose zones that you went to, and as you can see here, I'm actually playing as Babs instead. To the Earth was released by Cirque Verte in 1989, and in this game, I was actually having a lot of trouble getting my Retron 5 to be able to pick up the footage effectively on it. So I don't know a lot about this game, but I mean, it looks kind of cool from the cover. Top Gun was released by Konami in 1987 and has a reputation for being kind of a difficult game. Overall, the gameplay is pretty basic. You go around, you shoot some stuff, and then you land on an aircraft carrier. And that's really about it. Total Recall was released by Interplay Entertainment in 1990 and attempts to recreate in video game form its namesake from the movie Total Recall. Now, I don't think it follows it too closely, but overall it's kind of just a fun little beat-em-up. Track and Field was released by Kemco in 1987, and in this game you get to go through various track and field events, as you can see in the list here, and you just button mash and button mash until you get the score that you want to get, or until you beat that CPU. Track and Field 2 was released by Konami in 1989 and takes the exact same premise that the first game had, but it adds more of an Olympic feel to it. So you feel like the stakes are a little bit higher and it gives you a few different events. Ultima 3 Exodus was released by FCI in 1989 and is a classic RPG style game on the NES. It's a lot of fun, it has a very Final Fantasy feel to it, and it's just a great game to have in the collection. Vegas Dream was released by HAL America in 1990 and is exactly what you would expect from the cover. You get to go through, play a few different Vegas gambling style games, and just have some fun. Videomation was released by THQ in 1991, and in this game you actually, it's not so much a game as it is something where you get to kind of animate different pictures and add things to it and work kind of like a video editor. Wheel of Fortune was released by Game Tech in 1988 and is just that classic TV game show, Wheel of Fortune. You get to go through, pick some different players if you want, uh, add some computer players, and then you just play the game. Willow was released by Capcom in 1989 and is another one of those video game adaptations of a movie. This one, I feel, is actually one where it's pretty fun, though. You go through, you're playing as Willow, and you just have a blast going on this epic adventure. Wizards and Warriors was released by Acclaim Entertainment in 1987 and is, to me, kind of a peculiar game. I mean, it shows a map and everything kind of like uh, Castlevania kind of status, but it's a very strange kind of platforming, side-scrolling adventure game. Wizards and Warriors 3 was released by Acclaim in 1992, and in this game you have a lot of the same that you did in the original, with some better graphics, a little bit more polished gameplay, but still, it's a very peculiar kind of action-adventure, side-scrolling kind of game. World Class Track Meet was released by Nintendo in 1988 for use with the Nintendo Power Pad. But this game is kind of infamous because it's actually a total rebrand of the Bandai Stadium Events game, which is arguably the most expensive NES game in existence. World Games was released by Milton Bradley Company in 1989 and follows the same kind of path that a lot of these different sports games do. They give you a few events, you compete in them, you can go as different countries, go against a CPU, and that's really it. Where in Time is Carmen Sandiego was released by Konami in 1989 and is just another one of those old school Carmen Sandiego games. They had a bunch of them, Where in the World, Where in Time, and you just go around trying to find Carmen Sandiego. Wrath of the Black Manta was released by Taito in 1990 and this one is an action side scroller and it has elements of a beat em up but also elements of like a shinobi or a ninja gaiden kind of game. Wrecking Crew was released by Nintendo in 1985 and is another one of those awesome launch titles that came out for the console during its first year. In this game, you go through and the whole idea is just to wreck everything in sight so you can get the most points while avoiding enemies. WWF WrestleMania Challenge was released by LJN in 1990 and in this game you get classic WrestleMania action. You go through, you fight as different characters, and you just beat the heck out of your opponent in the ring. 
Xenophobe was released by Sunsoft in 1988, and in this game, it is your job to rid different star bases and different things of the overrun hordes of different aliens. So you just got to go through, kill all the baddies, and win the game. Yo Noid was released by Capcom in 1990, and this game I remember pretty well from my childhood because it was just a super fun action platformer where you went around playing as this weird dude in a bunny rabbit suit collecting pizzas and hitting people with a yo-yo. Very weird, but very fun. Up next we have Yoshi, released by Nintendo in 1992. And in this game, you are playing a kind of Tetris-style game, but you actually get to swap all of your stuff around even after it's been dropped. So it adds a nice little bit of unique gameplay to it. Yoshi's Cookie was released by Nintendo in 1993 and is another one of those late-release titles for the console. Now, this is very much another Tetris-style game, but again, they give it a unique twist with the way that you have to match your different objects, so it does keep it fun and interesting. The Legend of Zelda was released by Nintendo in 1987 and is the game that started probably my most admired and most favorite franchise from Nintendo of all time. This game, I mean, there isn't really much I can say about it other than it's a masterpiece. Now we have Zelda 2: The Adventure of Link, released by Nintendo in 1988. And this game is also an excellent game, but for totally different reasons. They added different side-scrolling, they added a very different kind of overworld map, but overall the game is still a ton of fun. Now for a few games I got after I started making this series of collection videos. First up is Demon Sword, released by Taito in 1990. And this one feels very run and gun, but ninja style. So as you can see, you're throwing stars and using your sword instead. Up next is The Guardian Legend, released by Nintendo in 1989. And from what I can tell, this is another kind of action RPG style game. But again, my Retro 5 was having some issues getting playback on this one. So I'll have to try and capture some footage for this later. Up next, we have Mappy Land, released by Taxon in 1989. And in this game, you run around playing as a happy little mouse collecting various objects while avoiding enemies. Super simple gaming concept, but the game is actually really bright, colorful, and kind of fun. Now here we have Metal Storm, released by Irem in 1991. And this game is kind of one of those hidden gems on the NES. Not a lot of people know very much about it, but it's actually a super fun game. And this one is going to be getting a collector's edition re-release here within the next year or so. Power Blade was released by Taito in 1991, and in this game you go around and you're actually using this blade that looks kind of like a boomerang, and that's your primary weapon to go around and just beat up the baddies. Adventure Island 2 was released by Hudson Soft in 1991 and takes the same classic gameplay of the first Adventure Island and just improves upon it. You get slightly better graphics, you get seemingly an overworld, and you get that same classic gameplay action that you would expect. And here we have another Nintendo classic. This is Ice Climber, released by Nintendo in 1985. And in this game, what you have to do is climb your way to the top using the brother and sister combo and fight off the baddies as you go. Jurassic Park was released by Ocean Software in 1993, and again is one of those late releases on the console. They released a lot of games in 93, and this one just takes the classic movie action and puts it in game form. Gives you kind of a top-down view and is actually pretty fun. The Rocketeer was released by Bandai in 1991 and tries to pull off a video game version of a movie, and it does an okay job, but overall the game really isn't that fun to me. So there you have it everyone, that is everything that was in my NES collection series. Now, if you guys liked today's video, please be sure to let me know down in the comments below. And while you're down there, please be sure to also hit those like and subscribe buttons, as well as that little notification bell so you can alert every time I got a new video coming out. Now, as always, I'm Game Dad. I thank you guys for watching, and I'll catch you later.